Hi, I'm Chike Coleman from the Wheelchair Watcher. This is Rural Reviews of the Cinematic Underground, the show where uh, Chuck Kaplinski and I talk about movies. Uh, this week, Chuck and I are going to be talking about a myriad of films. Uh, and it's been a couple weeks since our last show, and we have two weeks off uh, after the 15th, or two weeks off leading through the 15th. Um, how have things been? Very busy. Very yeah, I busy. can imagine so. Yes, but, uh, but good, good. No problems. We've seen a lot of good things. Uh, the first thing that we saw that I, I know that I enjoyed uh, was Ant-Man. And I, I'm never going to remember the director of Ant-Man because I'm so focused on all of Edgar Wright's influences. You might as well call it Edgar Wright's movie. But Ant-Man stars Paul Rudd and Michael Douglas and Corey, and I forget what Corey's last name is. Stahl. Stall. You once yelled at me when, because I didn't know who that guy was, by the way. Yeah, that was... Saying so now you can't remember his last mm, name. Yeah, really? I know. He's not been in much other than Ant-Man. Ant-Man's been his big thing. Um, and eventually Lily, as well. As is it Michael, Peyton Reed? As well as Michael Pena. Peyton Reed, yeah. Peyton Reed, yeah. Peyton Reed is the director. Um, you want to give the uh, premise and we'll talk? You talking to me? Yes. You talking to me? Yeah. A little bit. Did you ever see that movie? Is that uh, ah? You're gonna just blow all your credibility, right? <laughs> Taxi in front of driver, yeah, right? Have you seen it? Yeah, I have, but oh, okay. it's been a while. It's been a while. Okay. Uh, I I don't think about movies from the past too much. Anyway, Ant Man. That's part of the problem. It's about uh, um. Go ahead. <laughs> Scott Lang, recently released from prison, gets hired to do one last job by Hank Pym, played by Michael Douglas. Uh, I forget what the what is. This? Oh, Scott also has a daughter uh, who he is trying to provide for uh, because, of course, every film has to have a no-good father element. Uh, and so he takes a job for Hank Pym. Hank says, I want you to wear this Ant-Man suit and take something for me because it will make things better. It has a little bit of a tie into Avengers that I'm not going to spoil. Uh, and essentially, Hank... Uh, and Scott, and I want to forget. You got not get enough sleep last night. Yeah, I really didn't. It's, okay, I didn't go to it till two a.m. Help me. Okay, I don't know where you're at here. I'm at the part where he get, gets the job, Frank Pym. Okay, yeah. Well, the whole thing is that this technology has been stolen from Pym, and Scott Lang has been charged with stealing it back because the bad guy is going to weaponize this suit and sell it to Hydra which we can't let happen. True. Um, I had a lot of positives with this movie, specifically the humor between Pena and... Um, <laughs> my brain is Rudd? shot today. Rudd? Yes, Rudd. Mm -hmm. Pena and Rudd's chemistry was amazing. I love that. Uh, Corey Stoll played the stereotypical villain. Didn't like him, didn't hate him. I was kind of middle ground. Love the fight scenes and everything they did with the shrinking technology. I did not see this in 3D, so I didn't get the advantage of the 3D effect. I don't know if that helps or hurts the film. Mm. Uh, I would imagine it would aid it in some way. I kind of felt a little bit nostalgic watching this film, not because it felt like a heist film to me, but it reminded me of little bits of my favorite parts of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids mm -hmm. and the exploration that goes on and how freaked out. There's a scene in the club that I particularly like that... Uh, Ant-Man is trouncing around in, in miniature size, and it's interesting to see how he survives that chaos of the bouncing music and the moving feet, and it's just a really great collection of scenes and ideas, and you can tell that Edgar Wright's imprints are all over this film. Um, it has a lot of style, but luckily it has a lot of substance. I also believe Lang's relationship with his daughter and I believe how much he cares for his daughter. Um, eventually, Lily comes off as... <sighs> stern. Stern, cold is what I was going to say. Reticent. Reticent to even be involved in any of what her father wants to do, which... But she has good reason. Yeah, she does. She does because there's been a tragedy in her own past uh, connected to, of course, her father, mm -hmm. uh, which caused the estrangement that I like. I like that dynamic, and I like how that rebuild comes into play toward the end of the film. Mm -hmm. 
It's a competently made film. Would I have had more fun with it if it was directed by Edgar Wright? Sure. But is it a miss for Marvel's mini hits? No. Chuck, what did you think of Ant Man? I, I had a lot of fun with it. I mean, I think that was that's the key to this movie. Uh, it understands that even within the realm of superhero films, that this is ridiculous. Uh, and it, it's always kind of winking at us. Uh, I think Rudd is instrumental in making all of this work. He's such a likable performer. I have never heard anyone say, boy, I don't like Paul Rudd. Uh, yeah. And that really helps suck you in as well. And as you say, Michael Pena has two scenes that are killer mm -hmm. uh, when he's trying to recount a story, much like Chike is doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I, like I say, I, and I think that we needed a fun movie from Marvel because it seems though the other ones have been getting a little heavy. And I think this movie does a great job of reminding us that this is supposed to be fun. Let's just kick back, uh, check your brain at the door, and, and, and let's, just, let's just have a good time. Uh, poor Bobby Cannavale. Uh, I love mm -hmm. that guy. Uh, he has a thankless role. Yeah, a completely he... thankless role. And I know that Adam McKay, who's behind many of Will Ferrell's films and who's one of the screenwriters here, uh, talked him into doing the part. Uh, I'd go and punch Adam McKay in the nose if I was Mr. Cannavale because it's a thankless role. I would agree. I don't know why he talked him into doing it. Uh, but fun and two great little scenes after the credits that are, I think, key to what's coming up with Marvel as I, I know they're going to go very dark uh, with Captain America 3 or as it's being referred to as Avengers 2.5. Yeah. And here's the other thing I want to say is that one thing that really impresses me with Marvel is they go deeply dramatic with their main superheroes, but when they go to characters you, you don't know, they pull in the everyman work. And that just works so well for me. Such as? Well, of course, Lang. Uh, is right, but I mean, what other movies are you referring to? Uh, Guardians, of course. Guardians. Yeah. Nobody knew Guardians. And so well, and I think you could also make that argument with the first Iron Man. I mean... You definitely could, yeah. I mean, to mainstream folks, I doubt they really knew much about him. Uh, and I, I, I don't think he's an everyman, as you say, but Downey certainly did bring a sense of fun to that film yeah. that was vital to its success. You could relax and not have to tense up going, oh gosh, what's going to happen here, what's going to happen here, what's going to happen here. Yeah, it was and a lark. And I think that's what makes Marvel so successful is that balance that they're able to capture with each and every film they release. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to watch Fantastic Four next week, uh, produced by another corporation, uh, to see how they are, their take on all that is. I can't lie, I'm very nervous for that. I am too, uh, especially seeing as how they are screening it for critics on Wednesday night uh, for a Friday opening. And when they do that, that engenders no sense of confidence. I agree. So. You know, we've talked about that multiple times throughout the years that happens. Um, the next one I want to cover <laughs> is a movie that I didn't expect to see. It was kind of a surprise for me, but I ended up seeing it anyway. That is Amy Schumer's, or rather, Judd Apatow's, train wreck. Well, I think you have to say Amy Schumer's, too. She wrote the script. Amy Why Schumer, didn't you expect to see it? I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I didn't expect to be able to view it when I did, and when I did, I was uh, surprised. Trainwreck uh, talks about a character named Amy. She works at a made-up fashion magazine. <laughs> oh, I should go into the characters, though. We've got Amy Schumer, Bill Hader, LeBron James, uh, Amari Stoudemire, um, oh, oh, gosh, Colin, and I'm going to blank on his last name. Uh, Colin Quinn. Colin Quinn. Uh, and one of my other favorite actresses, Brie Larson, as well as somebody that uh, Chuck knows I have a deep love for, Miss Tilda Swinton, is also in the film. Um, this you? film... Go ahead. And yet you forget the biggest surprise in the movie. John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... Uh, see, I hated that character so much. But he was hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he yes. was hilarious. We'll get to why he was hilarious in a minute. Oh, he's not likable at all. But <laughs> um, Cena did a great job. <laughs> he, he did indeed. Um, so this film talks about a character named Amy uh, who works at a fashion magazine. Uh, who is a, can I, is it safe to call her a serial dater? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I would say I don't. Nah, I wouldn't even say a dater. Oh, uh, I mean, one she night doesn't stand. Date. I mean, it's just one night stands after another. She is she she's the poster child for um, the promiscuity. Uh, well, poster child for promiscuity and the consequences of how a divorce affects a child. Although we never really feel what those effects are until later in the film. Uh, and Amy has to do a piece on a sports doctor who does surgeries on athletes' legs, and she knows nothing about sports and is very cynical about sports. Uh, after spending time with the doctor, seeing how much he cares about people and others, she falls for him and falls for him hard. Uh, and she's very anti-establishment uh, in terms of romance and very self-referential about what she hates about herself and those around her. Uh, and that engenders the comedy and sours it, in my opinion. I feel like sometimes during train wreck we get too much of that. But I will say this, Amy Schumer has three standout scenes in this movie that I really love. All of them are when she's probably the most vulnerable. Um, the one involving something that happens to another character in the film and she has to attend uh, a, a funeral and wake and what comes out of that in her speech about the person they are there to see and the ensuing argument afterward is something that made me not see Amy Schumer but Amy Beth Schumer which is uh, Amy Schumer's middle name uh, and I love the human moment and the human element in that and I love her relationships with all the characters more than I do the self-referential humor in the film. Uh, John Cena, as you said, has a fantastic <laughs> role to play that, that makes fun of the profession he resided or resides in. I don't know if he's still he's in. He's still. He was just in Danville, or he's coming to Danville. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's still in that community of wrestling. Um, but he had a very wonderful part. Uh, as did Tilda Swinton, in a way we've never seen her before. And I, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, so, Chuck, tell me what you thought about Trainwreck. Uh, it's a pretty uneven movie. Uh, I liked it overall. I mean, I mm -hmm. would recommend it, but it's, pr it's, it's very uneven, uh, and I think it's too long, for one thing. I mean, mm -hmm. a comedy that runs over two hours is just tempting fate. Uh, comedy is about momentum. Yeah. And uh, it, it, I have always felt the best comedies are about 90 minutes long. You're yeah. boom, 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 and you're out of there. It's hard to sustain humor or a sense of momentum over any period of time. Uh, and when you're getting into over two hours, I mean, you're, you're doomed. Uh, <clears throat> it runs about 20 minutes too long. There are two scenes at the end that don't work at all. Uh, there's an intervention scene. Yeah, I agree. Uh, with uh, LeBron James, Chris Everett Lloyd, uh, yeah, Matthew Broderick, Broderick, and Marv Albert. It is yeah. dead in the water. Yeah. Uh, the final reunion scene with cheerleaders is doesn't pointless. work at all. Uh, it seemed to me as though Amy wanted to do everything that she possibly could in one movie. As though every idea she had, she wanted to cram in here. Uh, and it just becomes an overcrowded film. I was surprised by how serious it became at times. Mm -hmm. And I like that. that. I like that too, yeah. And I like the fact that they go out of their way to make her very unlikable. I mean, she is not a likable person at all. And to take the chance of doing that with your heroine, uh, it takes some guts. It does. I mean, I got to the point where I was saying, why is the doctor character having anything to do with her? Why are you doing this? My, she... my problem was the sense of pacing. Well, that's, again, it's too long. It's just too long, and that the pacing suffers. There was no build, really, in terms of you started with the self-referential humor, and you went with that for like a straight hour, and then one really serious bad thing happens, and you're into this beautiful. I would characterize it as one of the most beautiful scenes of the movie. Uh, what happens at the funeral? Yeah, it's very well done, but it's very jarring from what we've been experiencing before. True. Um, like I say, it's a mess, but it's a well-intentioned mess. I liked more of it than I hated it. And when it's funny, I mean, it's, it's hilarious. devastatingly funny. Right. Uh, the most hilarious one-on-one -on -one basketball game you will ever see in your life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Between Hayter and Lebr LeBron James. I mean, I laughed and laughed and laughed. And what he does physical the comedy. End, I was just done. Yeah. Well, physical comedy is so hard to do. And what they do there is, is so well done. Uh, Schumer has, a, a, the, there's an operating scene 
Yeah. Her reaction to the operating scene is priceless. Yeah, and what you'd expect as well. Right, but I mean, still her reactions. Uh, it's a very, very funny film, but I think it's a confused film. I wanted to see less, uh, which is, you know, usually the case right. in a lot of modern films. I want to see what she does next. I do too. I don't see her as a leading actress. I see her becoming. Unfortunately, I don't either. Well, I don't know if it's unfortunate. I just think she's got. She's. The emotional scenes, I think, are her sweet spot. If she stuck to that and then threw in a little bit of the self-referential comedy, or whether she was a good supporting character in another film. That's what I see her becoming: the good supporting character. Then, because I felt like Brie Larson was a bit out of place in the film. Uh, I just don't think she was given enough to do. Yeah, I'll give you that as well. And, and the Alistair Kid thing was kind of. Eh. I thought that was kind of funny too. Okay. But uh, um, I was going to tell you my favorite scene before we moved on to, uh, to recapping the Mission Impossible series, which is the scene involving the intern. Oh, uh, that was yeah. yeah hmm. A hysterical, yet at the same time, awfully awkward. Yeah. yeah. Um, but enjoyable when you learn the consequences of. How well, it was necessary for the plot. Indeed, yeah. very much so. Uh, so I would recommend it. I would, I would give too. it two and a half. With, res with reservations. Two and a half out of five. Yeah. It's not. It's not for everyone. Some people are going to find the self-referential humor a bit uh, offensive, maybe. <laughs> you think? Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. A little bit. Um, so wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Did you say that we were not going to have a show for the next two weeks? Yeah, I did. Okay. And how much time do we have left? 12, okay. Okay, we can get this done. Okay, uh, but I want to mention something before, you know. Don't worry, I'll speed Give me a couple minutes here I'll at the end. I'll speed through the first four Mission Impossible films. So, um, one thing I wanted to cover since I didn't get to see the fifth film in the Mission Impossible series, which is called Rogue, Rogue Nation, uh, and Chuck did. He's going to review it, but I want to go quickly through what my thoughts are on one through four. And Chuck, I would love if you could add some gravitas to my... Whimsy explanations. Whimsy, okay. Um, Ethan Hunt as a main character for the Mission Impossible series is like a hand that fits inside of a perfect glove. Tom Cruise really began his action career when he started being in these Mission Impossible films. Starting with, I believe it was 1994 or was it 96? I can't remember. I want to say 94, I will look it up. Um, and the first film was directed by Brian De Palma and had all of the twists and switcheroos of the old school spy movies as well as some unique modern twists. And I loved it because it was intense. Kind of didn't let you go, left you on the edge of your seat, and it was great. Number two, um, I really, really hate because it's a bio-terrorist reference thing and Thandie Newton isn't really that great. It's kind of a cheesy action movie, uh, this time directed by John Woo, and we should say that every Mission Impossible film gets a different director. Uh, Mission Impossible 3 started the high watermark of the Mission Impossible films because you got Tom Cruise back, you added in a few new elements like Simon Pegg, um, and uh, you also had a very credible villain, uh, unlike the first two films, and Philip Seymour Hoffman, probably the best villain of the series. Uh, with some really great camera work by J.J. Abrams detailing yet another crazy wild mission that Ethan has to go on, but this time he's trying to choose between domestic life and life as an IMF agent. Uh, Ghost Protocol, directed by Brad Bird, changes things up again. This time Cruz has another new team uh, with Benji in tow and two other operatives, including a guy named Brent, is that right? Mm -hmm. Brent or Brent, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, and Paula Patton, who sits this fifth entry out. Uh, but, but the fourth entry was great because it gave the film a sense of scale that had been missing since the first film, I believe, even if the villain wasn't that intriguing. Uh, so now we're on to Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Chuck, what did you think of the fifth entry in this franchise? Directed by Christopher McQuarrie. Uh, I liked it. It's not the best of the bunch, I don't think. I prefer the fourth one, the last one, Ghost Protocol. 
Uh, but it is, it's serviceable, no doubt about it. Uh, the thing I, like, I find intriguing about the Mission Impossible films is that they seem to me to be getting better as they go. I was not a fan of the first one. I thought the second one was okay, but as you say, in the third one, things start to turn. Uh, and I think they've just gotten progressively better as they've gone along. Uh, this one's pretty good. It, the, the plot is the plot. I mean, it is an amalgam, you could say, of the last, you know, if you wa take any five spy movies you've seen in the last 10 years, you could take a piece from each and this is the plot. Uh, he is after a organization called the Syndicate, who he thinks is responsible for uh, terrorist acts around the world. Thing is, no one believes that the Syndicate exists except him. Mm. Uh, uh, even to the point to where the CIA doesn't believe the Syndicate exists. And we have Alec Baldwin in the mis mix this time as the head of the CIA. He wants to get rid of the impossible missions force. He says that the syndicate is just a figment of their imagination used to justify their existence. I feel like he's in the syndicate. In the syndicate. So, uh, you have CIA agents after our hero. You have people from the syndicate after our hero. And then there's a mysterious woman who pops up occasionally throughout the film. Sometimes she wants to kill Hunt. Sometimes she wants to help him. We're never quite sure what she's doing until towards the end. And she's played by Rebecca Ferguson, a young woman from England. Uh, like I say, the plot's no big thing, but the stunts are. And the stunts are, as usual in this franchise, quite spectacular. Uh, this is popcorn, summertime action at its best as far as the stunts are concerned. The airplane thing that they've been making a lot of fuss about actually is the first scene in the film. So they're starting, they're setting the bar very high uh, with that being that first, move, first uh, scene in the movie. Uh, there's a great moment, a great car chase in the claustrophobic streets of Casablanca. Motorcycles, a Jeep, and a car. A really cool, very well done. There's also a break-in. They have to break into an energy plant. Okay. And if you've seen the clips, uh, you see him diving into water. Yeah. Uh, they have to go into this underwater, this underground tank that's filled with water, and he's got to do something within a specific time frame uh, in order to ensure one of his other cohorts get in. It's very elaborate, and it's very well done, too. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking for some really cool, oh, wow moments, the movie has them. Uh, Story-wise, eh, not bad, but certainly nothing, nothing fresh. Okay. So we'll stick with High Water Run being Ghost Protocol. That's for me, anyway. I would agree with you, uh, knowing what I know about the past three, but I'll have to see number five to find out. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about today, I want to get to what you wanted to talk about first, though. Uh, seeing as how we are not going to uh, have a show next week, I just want to mention a film that's coming out on the 8th called The Gift, <coughs> a movie I saw Ooh. recently, and it is one of the best films I've seen this year. Uh, the Gift is from Bloomhouse Productions. Bloomhouse Productions uh, are famous for low-budget horror films, uh, particularly paranormal activity, uh, sinister, uh, insidious. And their secret is to keep budgets low, uh, and then everyone takes a part of the profits when they make gads of money. The Gift is kind of a departure, though. It's not a supernatural thriller uh, by any sense. Uh, it's much more of a cerebral type thing, and it is written and directed by Joel Edgerton. <coughs> He's from Australia. You've seen him in various movies over the years. Uh, primarily, uh, I think the biggest thing he had was Warrior with Tom Hardy. Indeed, I remember him well. He was also the co-writer of a film called The Rover that came out a couple years back from Australia. He never came to town. Guy Pierce and Rob Guy Pierce, Pattinson. Robert Pattinson convinced me that Pattinson could direct. I can't recommend that highly enough. <clears throat> this film, though, The Gift, stars Jason Bateman and Rebecca Hall. Uh, they play a couple who have just moved to Los Angeles, the Los Angeles area. Uh, and they have a new house, and they run into an old friend of Bateman's, played by Edgerton, an old guy that uh, he knew from high school. Doesn't remember him too well, but does after they begin talking. Uh, the couple moves in, they're trying to start new jobs, and all of a sudden this guy is always around. Shows up at the door with a gift, uh, ingratiates himself into the door for dinner, shows up to help for things every time the husband, played by Bateman, isn't around, and starts a friendship with the wife. It's nothing inappropriate or any sense like that, but right. it's a friendship uh, that she starts to value because her husband is always away. Um, eventually, Bateman tells him to take a hike, that what he's doing is inappropriate and that they don't want anything to do with him at all. And then things get interesting. Uh, I can't even tell you how well this is done as far as 
constantly and steadily ratcheting up the tension of this movie. I want to say right away, this is not a uh, fatal attraction. This is not playing Misty for me. This is not single white female in which this becomes a slasher movie. That's not what this is. This is much smarter than that. And this is a movie that is uncompromising in what it says about bullying, its effects, and the ending is going to be one that is just going to be leaving you thinking and talking. This movie blindsided me. I thought it would be good. I did not think it would be one of the best movies I've seen this year. This is one I'm going to be watching again and again because I want to make sure I'm catching all the intricacies of this very, very smart movie, The Gift. Do not miss it. So it sounds to me very much like this is a psychological mind game movie, which I'm going to enjoy very much. Yes. Um, I really, I've seen trailers for this, and um, uh, this is one of the few occasions when I watch the trailer and I feel nothing is spoiled. Exactly right. Exactly right. And thank you for bringing that up. I read an article not too long ago about trailers being spoiled and they saying studies show that viewers want to know as much, which I think is a bunch of crap. No. But you're very right. The surprises are held back and I think that really lends to the power of the film. Because I think, at least from what I've seen from the trailers, you're asking questions about who is this creepy guy, but also you're asking... Who is Bateman? Exactly. Who's and not only that, but why is he doing what he's doing? Yeah. You're, you're not given anything in the trailer. Like, my, my whole hypothesis is, did Rebecca Hall's character actually end up marrying the bully? And how, d how does being the bully and having that brought back affect Bateman? Does it change who he is? Does he revert? What happens? It made me ask a bunch of little tiny questions just from that one uh, and, a, uh, and a half minute trailer. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover today uh, is Daredevil, because I've been watching some more of that. I saw episode three, I believe it is, Rabbit in a Snowstorm. Uh, the plot is fairly simple. Guy goes to a bowling alley uh, to bowl game of uh, bowling. This guy is having a private game. He says, take a hike. The dude's like, no, I want to bowl. A fight breaks out, and he kills the guy. Then later on, uh, Matt Murdock and his sidekick and friend, Foggy Nelson, have to represent this guy who killed this Russian mobster. Meanwhile, you have... Uh, the newspaper guy, whose name I'm not going to remember, Ben, uh, being upset because he cannot cover crime stories anymore because n no uh, citizen apparently is interested in, in that kind of serious news. They want fluff pieces. What color are you going to change the subway line? Um, there's also a side plot about Karen Page and what happened to her within the first two episodes and how the company wants to keep her quiet for uh, uh, as long as humanly possible. Thank you. Uh, and, of course, there's Matt Murdock doing his daredevil superhero saving thing. Chuck, did you see Rabbit yes. in the Snowstorm? Mm -hmm. Do you remember it? What did yes. you think about it when you saw it? Uh, a little slow, but uh, you have to be a little patient because uh, all the pieces are going to start coming together. Um, very well done. Um, <clears throat> incredibly violent, though. I mean, there's, 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 there's one moment towards the end that really set me back and sent my 10-year-old scurrying upstairs saying he was never going to watch the show again. Uh, yeah, I, can I felt that same feeling when I finished it recently. I can understand them wanting to be rough and hard and edgy, but they, they kind of went over the line on that one for me. But still, a very intelligent, well-acted show. I do like it. Mm -hmm. And we get the first glimpse at uh, Vincent D'Onofrio's version of Wilson Fisk. Kingpin. Uh, so th that is our impressions of Episode 3 of Daredevil. If you have not started watching that show, you should. Yep. It's fantastic. Um, please watch The Gift when it comes to theaters into town. Mm -hmm. I'll be looking forward to Chuck's review. You might also have a review from me on The Gift as soon as I... I'm able to see it. And until then, you can find Chuck Kaplinski's reviews at the Illinois Times and mine at wheelchairwatcher.com. Until then, we will see you in two weeks.